afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Distinguished service professor Raymond H. Robinson will now lead the procession of our graduates.
above the urge to settle for the status quo. You are the vanguard of a new world, a world that is yet to be made. Would all graduates and their guests please rise? Please remain standing until you are asked to be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of Northeastern University, Joseph E. Aoun, will now lead the procession. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Dean of Northeastern University Law School, Emily A. Spieler. Thank you, Chief Marshall. Please join me in welcoming Joseph Aoun, President of Northeastern, members of the Board of Trustees, Stephen Director, Provost of the University, and other members of the senior leadership team, the faculty of the School of Law, other leadership of the university, honored guests, family, friends, and of course, most importantly, the Northeastern University School of Law Class of 2011. <laughs> this is a time for celebration. At the end of these activities, you, our graduates, will be leaving us with the degree of Juris Doctor. This is an achievement that you and your family should celebrate. You've survived a tough three years. You've changed and grown in knowledge and wisdom since you made the decision to come to law school. But before we salute you, I'd like to ask that we take a moment to thank the others who've helped you to reach this important moment. You would not have survived without the help of your parents, grandparents, spouses and partners, children and friends. They were the ones who supported you, both financially and emotionally, while you worked hard, grappled with new ideas and new thinking, figured out how not only to study, but also to be a lawyer. Sometimes, maybe often, they suffered from your inattention when you simply didn't have enough time to attend to the people you love. So would the members of the graduating class please rise and turn to face your families and friends. And now let us give your family and friends a rousing round of applause, recognizing their contribution to this moment. introduce our speakers, there are a few words that I would like to direct to you, our students, momentarily to be our graduates. 
Your class, the class of 2011, leaves a strong legacy at Northeastern. You made the NU Law Journal a permanent fixture for this law school. And in your three years here, you participated in three successful student organized symposia, focusing on the subprime fallout, the Second Amendment, and food law issues, followed by the successful publication of impressive journals. Your work on this journal helps to launch your careers and leaves behind a tradition of excellence for future Newsel students. And at least two of you, in addition, have already published articles in leading law journals outside Northeastern. You were the pilot fish for two new dual degree programs with Vermont Law School and Environmental Law and Policy and with Brandeis and Sustainable International Development. You were critical players in helping us build our global law program under the guidance of Hope Lewis and others. You had terrific successes in moot corp competitions around the country, including, including in the tremendously competitive Jessup International competition. You played a central role in the development of the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project, now a clinic under the leadership of Margaret Burnham. You helped us through many difficult community conversations about issues that were internal and some that affected the world outside. You worked to create new pathways of communication between the student body and the administration, and you labored with us to work toward better models of student participation in law school governance. In your first year, you did amazing work in your social justice projects, providing valuable pro bono assistance to organizations and learning firsthand the ways in which law can address disparities in social injustice. Among others, you helped Con you contributed to the litigation strategies for gender non-conforming purses for Lambda Legal. You helped prisoners secure mental health services for the Massachusetts Black and Latino Legislative Caucus. You helped address weak sexual assault campus disciplinary proceedings for the Victims' Rights Law Center. There's a long list of these projects, all of which made a difference in the world and all of which taught you the basics of how to approach a real world legal problem in a collaborative team. It made your first year rough, we know that. But you learned things you would not have learned at any other law school in the country. And like your predecessors, you have fanned out across the country and across the world on your co-ops. You completed almost 800 co-ops in 32 states and 15 foreign countries on six continents, from Boston to California to Louisiana, from Canada to Australia, to Brazil and Colombia and Ecuador, Cambodia, China, Korea, Laos, Switzerland, Austria, Ireland, and the UK, to Tanzania and South Africa. You have worked in every legal setting imaginable, state and federal courts, international tribunals, domestic and foreign legal service organizations and public defenders offices, unions, levels of government, in-house counsel in both the for-profit and not-for-profit world, and in law firms of every size, both in the US and globally. You've learned the importance of international law, not, not just abroad, but at home in the US. You did extraordinary human rights work with refugees at asylum access in Quito, on disability rights with the Center for Disability Law and Policy in Galway, on access to justice and the right of citizens in developing countries to competent legal representation with international bridges to justice in Geneva with the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague, for, with the International C Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and in the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia and Phnom Penh. You worked on environmental issues in Australia and at private law firms and in Boston and across the US, but also in places as different from Boston as Vientiane, Rio de Janeiro, Beijing, and Bogota. A true record of G both geographic and legal adventuresomeness. 95% of you completed at least one public interest co-op. More than two thirds of you completed more than one. And by doing this, you contributed an extraordinary number of pro bono hours to help mar marginalized individuals and groups. While many of you have already started studying for the bar, you will soon be spreading out across the country as judicial clerks, it, from Alaska to Maine as public defenders, from California to New York, in law firms from Texas to Massachusetts. And quite a few of you have received prestigious postgraduate public interest fellowships. You will be working at Pennsylvania Legal Aid in Philadelphia on a Martin Luther King Fellowship, at Health Law Advocates in Boston on a Parmet Health Law Fellowship, 
at Medical Legal Partnership, also in Boston, as a Skadden Fellow at Casa Mirna Vasquez on an Equal Justice Works Fellowship, at the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund in Washington, D.C. on a Reproductive Justice Fellowship, and at the Defender Association of Philadelphia Juvenile Division. One of you has been chosen as one of the first of 18 fellows out of 500 applicants for the new three-year Public Defender Fellowship, a joint initiative of Equal Justice Works and the Southern Public Defender Training Center. Congratulations, you have done well, and I have not a single doubt that you will continue to do both do well and do good. You should indeed feel, feel confident. Because of the Northeastern program, you know more about how to practice law and how to think about the law and the relationship of the law to society and to justice than your peers who are graduating from other law schools this spring. You are poised to be both great lawyers and great leaders. You have a lot to be proud of, and we are very proud of you. But it is important to remember that the degree you receive today carries with it special priv privileges and very special obligations. It's almost exactly a thousand days. I don't know if you remember that, but I said in a thousand days I'll be talking to you at commencement when I welcomed you at orientation. It's almost exactly a thousand days since I welcomed you to Northeastern in the fall of 2008. These three years have been bracketed by turbulent politics, financial collapse, world conflict, and environmental disaster in the Gulf, and a very re recent wave of change across North Africa and the Mideast whose end is not yet in sight. In this turbulent environment, the careful study and practice of the law becomes ever more important. We are very lucky to live in a country in which we strive to abide by the rule of law. It is through the law that we guarantee basic rights and freedoms and through the law that we defend these rights. But we are challenged in this country as people everywhere are challenged to ensure that the rule of law also means that we govern ourselves carefully and well. The diversity of our country and our national quest for both pluralism and unity require us to look to the law for our common moral code, for the normative glue that holds people together. It is the role of good lawyers to lead us on the path toward a rule of law that is also a law of justice. The strategic use of the law to achieve good rests in your hands, our future lawyers and our future judges. As new lawyers, you join a deeply important profession and tradition. We hope that we have done our job well. We hope that you have learned both the mechanics and the soul of the law. We hope that you fully understand that law is a learned profession tied to strong ethical and moral standards. You as lawyers are called upon to rep represent your clients well, while also helping to advance the principles of justice. It's not always easy to balance these tensions. We trust we have given you the tools and the courage to navigate this sometimes difficult terrain. We hope that you take with you from the people who have taught you and from the people with whom you have studied a deep tolerance of diversity and an equally deep intolerance for injustice. If we have accomplished this, then you and we have done our shared three-year job well. I personally wish you well as you walk down the next path and find your voices as lawyers in this challenging, sometimes scary, but almost always wondrous world. Take risks when it matters. I think that was my first advice to you three years ago. Have fun. Do good for others as well as for yourselves. Stay true to who you are. Hang on to your passion. Stay in touch with each other. You can help each other in both the good and the bad times. And finally, always stay brave. Never, ever be afraid to speak truth to power. It is now my privilege to introduce several speakers elected by the graduating class to speak at this commencement. First, the class has elected two student speakers. This is a very special recognition from the graduating class, and I'm, in, I'm delighted to introduce this year's selected students. First. Kristen Dovro, where are you, Kristen? Come on up. 
Kristen is a 2005 graduate of Wellesley College where she majored in sociology. She worked on co-op co for federal judge Nancy Gertner, the elder law unit at Greater Boston Legal Services, and two Boston law firms, Brody Hardoon and Looney Grossman. She is managing editor of the Northeastern University Law Journal, was an LSSC lawyering fellow, legal research and writing teaching assistant, and SBA 1L mentor. Kristen, come on up. I thought I was going second, just a little, all right. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to be standing before you on such a momentous occasion and have the opportunity to share a piece of myself with you to commemorate the day. What a journey these past three years have been. Sleepless nights were commonplace, coffee addictions became slightly more acute, and my personal favorite, under eye circles, became shockingly pronounced. <laughs> but in spite of it all, we, the class of 2011, made it. <laughs> Woo! We have good reason to feel an incredible sense of pride today, not only in ourselves, but in each other. We survived a rigorous academic curriculum, flourished during four diverse co-ops, and worked in conjunction with one another on cutting-edge social justice projects. We also navigated, or more like continue to navigate, the job market with resolve and fortitude. Law school is certainly no small feat. But today is also a time for humility and reflection. I have found that the, the latter is rather impractical, or at least ill-advised, during the stupor of law school. But now that the fog is finally lifting, I have found myself contemplating my time at Northeastern. You know what stands out the most? The people. Northeastern attracts a certain kind of individual, the type you want to keep close for a lifetime. The people I've met here are so incredibly accomplished and comprise some of my most remarkable friendships. I continue to be in awe of the poise with which my classmates manage to balance some incredibly momentous life events from marriages and the birth of children, to breakups and the loss of loved ones. You name it, we've done it. We've also each found that unique group of classmates who have helped us become better people and pushed us to become savvy practitioners with a strong moral compass. But like Dean Spieler said, there is a group of people who often get lost in the shuffle. Especially on a day like today, where the focus is intended to be on our vast accomplishments as graduates, the partners, family members, friends, and loved ones whose support was integral to our success seldom receive the recognition they deserve. I'd like for that to change today. Being close to any law student is incredibly draining. <laughs> Let's face it, we're a particularly demanding bunch. Some may say high maintenance. Yet, how do we thank those around us for enduring such an unenviable role? Predictably, we're cranky, irritable, exhausted, impatient, that's me, and unable to commit to anything that's not school related. We are no walk in the park. Simply put, the people who stuck by us during our successes and struggles over these past three years are saints. The significant other who turned a blind eye just last week to yet another dinner alone because of your late night studying, a saint. The best friend who didn't kill you for missing his birthday celebration because you were writing a paper, another saint. And what about all of the individuals whose sacrifices long ago made it possible for us to be here today? The father who picked up a third job decades ago just to put food on the table, a saint. The grandmother who continued to work late into her 70s just so that you would have enough money to attend after school programs, a saint. Today is not only about us. It's about paying homage to all those people in our lives whose support 
strength, and encouragement paved the way for us to arrive to this point. So please, no matter the overwhelming excitement today brings, let's commit ourselves to making the time today to say thank you to all those who helped us along on our journey to and through law school. Congratulations, everyone. Sorry if I got the order wrong. <laughs> so the second student speaker <laughs> is Chris Logue. Chris is a 2008 graduate of UMass, where he graduated summa cum laude in political science and philosophy. Chris, come on up. He did co-ops with Casamirna, as well as Farm Sanctuary in New Orleans, Greater Boston Legal Services, Suffolk Probate Project, and the Roxbury Defenders Unit of CPCS. He also completed Domestic Violence and the Prisoner's Rights Clinic. He will be an Equal Justice Works Fellow at Casamirna beginning this coming fall, where he will work to create a three-way intersection among legal, medical, and community-based social services. Chris. Congratulations. Hello. How's it going? So everything is so, so fancy here today. This is, I guess it's pomp and circumstance is what they call it. Well, you know, I have to be honest, though, I think there was a, a good amount of pomp, but kind of lacking on the circumstance. That. <laughs> um, but really, I would like to... <laughs> that, I shouldn't note to self, don't write a joke right before you say it. So, I would really like to, though, first and foremost, uh, thank each and every one of you for being here today. Thank you, 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 thank you. Okay, okay. But no, seriously, let's get real. Um, I have to be honest, I actually, I actually totally forgot about that I was supposed to do this. I had no, I totally slipped my mind and I didn't actually remember until this morning when I was coming in. And uh, th thankfully I got, a, I got a text from Dean Spieler and she said, she said it, it just said, yo, low down, that's my nickname, low down, yo, low down, wicked psyched about the speech today. Keep it real, dog, big D. I guess D stands for Dean, big D. So anyway, so I, I just, and I, I, I freaked out, and I, but it was too, too early to write another speech, so I came here this morning, and, uh, and I saw Dean Spieler again, and I told her, I don't know what to do. I, I'm supposed to give this speech, but I totally forgot. And she said, it's okay, it's okay. She saved me again, because she said, there's this book I keep on me. I always keep on me, it's, it's just very, wherever I go, whatever I do, I keep this book on me. Why don't you just read a chapter from that? So. Today's speech will be the chapter, And Justice for All, from Bill O'Reilly's memoir, A Bold, Fresh Piece of Humanity. <laughs> you know, the only part of that that's not a joke is that Bill O'Reilly wrote a memoir called A Bold, Fresh Piece of Humanity. <laughs> that actually happened. <clears throat> um, but, okay, but I did actually, now I'm getting real, I did actually, um, think a lot about what I would say today. And what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you a lesson that I've learned um, while I've reflected on what it means to be a lawyer. And to do that, I'd like to share with you a parable. And this parable comes from um, this, uh, a philosopher who is, who is really um, influential and important to me. His name is Peter Singer. And he wrote an essay in 1999 called The Singer Solution to World Poverty. And this is the parable that he sets up. There's an older man who's just retired and he has a classic car. It's a 1969 Ford Mustang. And it's his prized possession. It means everything to him in the world. And he's out for a drive on a Sunday afternoon and he parks by a set of railroad tracks to take a short walk. So while he's on this walk, he sees that a train is coming and the train is out of control and it's headed right for his Mustang, his classic car. But just ahead of him is a switch. And he realizes that he can pull this switch diverting the train and saving his precious car. But if he does this, the train is going to divert and it's going to hit and kill a small boy who's up ahead. So the point of this parable is to set up the ethical dilemma. Does the man save his car or does he save the boy? But more importantly, I think the, the, it's, the point of this is to illustrate how obvious the answer is, right? Everyone would say that you should save the boy. 
If you knew this guy in real life, and he told you that he threw the switch in a train, killed a small boy because he wanted to save his car, you'd think he was a lunatic. You'd think he was a sociopath. And the moral of the story for me is that we all have a basic moral intuition that life is more important than stuff. In other words, when we have more resources that we need to simply get by, we all share an instinctual ethic that those resources regardless of how precious they are or how hard we worked for them, are never more important than saving another person from harm. And now that I'm about to be a lawyer, this parable and the ethical point that it makes have again become really important to me because I realize that the degree I'm about to receive bestows on me an unbelievable amount of privilege and that that privilege is a resource. And, you know, I understand how easy it is to lose sight of the enormity of that, of that privilege. Because I have to step back every so often and remind myself that I live in one of the most privileged and prosperous places in the world, and that even within that prosperity, I'm now entering a class of the ultra-privileged. And this privilege really, it's really not about the money that comes along with being in this class, but at the core of it, the privilege is about living in a place where law is the language of power. And that for the vast majority, this language is a foreign one. That for the vast majority, when they come up against the law, a law that may be threatening to lock them up, to take away their money, to take away their life, or to simply refuse to protect them, they find that they're being spoken to in a language that they can't understand, and they're being told to respond in a language that they don't speak. But we speak that language. And we are here today because we have committed to learning the language of power. And that, I think, is a privilege that is so enormous. And it's a resource that is so precious. So ultimately, what I've learned and what I've hoped to share with you through this is that privilege is a resource that I have. And that like the man with the classic car, I have a decision to make every day about how I use that resource. And I may not know exactly how I will use that resource of privilege, but I know that it is not a thing to be ignored, to be taken for granted, or to be ashamed of. But rather, it's a thing that I should acknowledge, that I should embrace, and that I should share. And be before, I, before I leave you today, that's pretty much all I have to say. Before I leave you today, um, two quick things. One is an apology. Um, a few weeks ago, I was talking to my dad, and my father had, he had one request for me. He's like, he's, you know, this graduation, it's all about you. It's, you know, this, just make it about you. But like, I have one request. Somewhere in the speech, can you throw in a Yankees suck? <laughs> so my apology is, I'm sorry, dad, I'm running out of time. But maybe, maybe the next one, I'll get that. And so in closing, I'd like to read a poem, a very short poem. Um, not by me, though. So I was telling you earlier that this morning I was talking with, with Dean Spieler. Um, we were texting and then talking. And then um, as I was walking away with uh, a bold, fresh piece of humanity, um, she grabbed me back and she said, she said, yo, Logue, I, can, you, can you help me out here? I, you know, this class of 2011, it's just like so amazing. It's like the best class ever. And I, I was up late last night and I was reminiscing about my, my years in slam poetry and I wrote a poem. I was inspired and I wrote a poem, but I'm too embarrassed to read it. <laughs> Could you read that for me? And I said, yo, D, big D. <laughs> of course, I'll hook you up, all right? So in closing, the Class of 2011, a poem by Emily Spieler, Dean of the Northeastern University School of Law. <laughs> Damn, girl, this class is so fine. Blowing up like Kanye, blowing my mind. When I see you in the halls, I peer into your mind. I see wicked smart things brewing inside. I want to hold you tight and never let go, because you're the raddest thing that happened since Wade was taken down by Roe. <laughs> you crazy, sexy, cool, hold on to that, but go slow. Because you're going to save this messed up world. I'm sure of it, I know. Thank you.
So I was thinking about how I was going to get out from under, but maybe not. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. So in addition, this is for the your uh, family and friends, in addition to electing two students to speak and in addition to the selection of a formal graduation speaker, the graduating class also every year elects a member of the law faculty to give a faculty address at the commencement. And this year, the students have elected Professor Rashmi Dilchan for this honor. So for those who don't know her, um, Professor D.L. Chan joined the Northeastern faculty in 2002. Immediately before joining the faculty, she was Associate General Counsel at the Community, the community Builders, a nonprofit affordable housing developer. She has also served before joining the faculty as a law clerk to Judge Warren Fer Ferguson of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. She was a public interest fellow of the law, at the law firm of Hall & Associates in Los Angeles, and she practiced in the business department of the Boston law firm of Foley Hoag, where she specialized in transactions involving intellectual property. Since 2002, Professor D.L. Chan has been one of the anchors for our property law curriculum. She teaches first year property law, has taught the introductory intellectual property law course, as well as modern real estate development, and a new course in community economic development. Her research focuses on property, property law poverty and economic development. She has examined issues of credit, including micro lending and credit card lending as a means of economic development. Her article, Human Worth is Collater Collateral, won the 2006 Association of American Law School Scholarly Papers Competition for New Teachers. And she's not 100 years old either. <laughs> uh, Professor D.L. Chand earned her undergraduate de degree at Grinnell and her JD here at Northeastern. Rashmi. What a beautiful sight you are. Thank you, class of 2011, for giving me the opportunity to address you and your loved ones on this special day. My gratitude to you is just a hair's breadth short of motivating me to name my next child Northeastern in your honor. It's close. It was a close call, but I, I'm nonetheless very honored. Whether through your evidence class or through the controversy surrounding WikiLeaks or just through having lived life thus far in this modern age, at some point, it must have become clear to you that email is not a secure form of communication. <laughs> In further demonstration of that fact, I want to tell you about an email that I recently received from my colleague, Professor Stephen Subrin. <laughs> not too long ago, Steve emailed me to express his concern about the increasing danger to our planet's future and to civilization that climate change poses. As he described it, it has taken him too long to realize the threat, which has really become more real to him as he thinks about his grandchildren's future. But now that he has seen it, he has begun to look for ways in which to contribute his advocacy skills in counteracting the threat. Steve's email is the perfect illustration of the message that I want to give you as you leave this law school. It is a message that will be relevant to you in good and bad economic times. Whether you are working in a large corporate law firm or in a small nonprofit organization. Whether your practice is litigation based, transactional, or even outside the scope of what is traditionally described as lawyering. It is both a reminder and a call to action. And boiled down, it is this. While your law degree confers upon you a particular status in society, it also confers a duty. At its core, Steve's email was an acknowledgment of a duty to respond to injustice 
in one's role as a lawyer. I might even say it's the passionate edge of your newly recognized status. Each of you now has both the ability and the responsibility to engage when you encounter injustice. Not to stand passively by and assume that the particular issue raised falls outside your area of expertise, or that you've already billed enough pro bono hours for the month, or that it just doesn't concern you. Indeed, one of the lessons from Steve's example is his humility and commitment in supporting this particular cause, even though he has many colleagues, students, and friends who for years already have been committed and talented advocates for the environment, even though he has described himself as coming to the issue too late and with little substantive knowledge. And just as your status as a lawyer will last a lifetime and ideally grow as you prove yourselves in a variety of different settings, so too should your duty last a lifetime. Think here of Steve's continued engagement after more than 40 years of teaching and writing about other important questions of social justice, he thought hard about it and recognized that he has something to contribute as a lawyer to this particular form of injustice. Now, knowing my colleagues as I do, I know you've been hearing versions of this message from your first day at Northeastern. But I also know how pressing the early years of practice can be. So let me be a bit more precise about what I mean when I remind you about the duty that comes with being a lawyer. At a minimum, when you read or hear about a wrong in the newspaper or on the radio, or when you are confronted with it in your community, you now have the responsibility to ask the following question. What could I do to learn more about this situation? And in particular, about the ways that I, as a lawyer, could act to rectify it. A transactional lawyer might describe this as a duty of due diligence that accompanies your law degree. But I hope, of course, that there will be times in your lives when you will go beyond the minimum of asking that question that at times this duty will also be a duty to act. By duty to act, I do not mean to suggest that you have a duty to exercise a particular kind of expertise, to be litigious, or to interpret rules, or even to act in the service of a client. Indeed, you can and should challenge your own role as experts as you think about how to fulfill this duty. Nor do I mean to suggest that this duty can be defined simply by fulfilling a pro bono requirement or by working for a public interest organization. To the contrary, this duty is both more specific and more individual. And those of you whom I've had the privilege to teach, and that's many of you, know that I also do not mean that your duty to act as a lawyer necessarily means that you have to uphold some particularized or abstract notion of the rule of law or even of social justice. Rather, part of my purpose in giving you this call to action today is to nudge you to deliberate about what it is by way of skill, knowledge, or mode of thinking that you have gained by becoming a lawyer and that you will continue to gain as you develop as a lawyer. I'm asking you to think about the connection between the particular wrongs that you will inevitably encounter and the ways in which you, in your unique and professional capacity, can rectify those wrongs. As graduates of this law school, I believe you have the capacity to innovate new ways to translate law's ideals into real-world applications. That could be one way to make the connection. Ultimately, though, it is that which you individually have gained that you now have a duty to share.
Steve Subrin's email to me was a piece of his effort to make that connection. Since then, he has been using his considerable skills and resources as an advocate and law professor to join our colleague Lee Breckenridge and dozens of present and former students, faculty, and staff who have been working zealously on this problem for decades. These lawyers are working to, together to develop a number of strategies to change the way Americans relate to the climate and to support those among our elected officials who are taking the threat seriously. Julie Sue also made that connection when in 1995, only one year after graduating from law school, she successfully litigated a lawsuit on behalf of 80 Thai women who worked 18 hours a day in a sweatshop under armed guard. What she may have lacked in litigation experience, Julie amply offset with an organizational strategy in which she made her clients into colleagues who worked as engaged members of her litigation team. She challenged and redefined her role as an expert to produce a result that sent shock waves throughout the garment industry. And in doing so, she combined her newly acquired litigation skills with her organizing skills, with her own unique connection with the community of women who were her clients. These are just two examples of lawyers who have used their legal talents in acknowledging and fulfilling their responsibility as lawyers, whether on issues of labor organizing, fairness in the workplace, tax fairness, eradication of AIDS, international human rights, reducing discrimination, nuclear disarmament, neighborhood renewal, immigration law, the list goes on. You are joining a long tradition. And wherever you choose to practice, that tradition should inform your individual sense of duty as lawyers. This is a day of celebration. I share your joy, and I take pride in what each of you has accomplished. But it is also, as others have said, a day of reflection about what it means to have attained this particular degree at this particular historical and social moment. In the rush of bar preparation and resume polishing and life after graduate school, I do hope that you will take the time to celebrate your accomplishments and to reflect upon your new responsibility as lawyers. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Deal Chan. President Aoun will now come to the podium for the conferral of the honorary degree. Mr. President, the Board of Trustees of Northeastern University has authorized the conferral of an honorary degree upon the following candidate in recognition of notable achievement in her field. Rashida Manju for the degree of Doctor of Laws escorted by the Honorable Nani Burns and Professor Hope Lewis. Thank you, Dean Spieler. It is my pleasure to call upon the Honorable Nani Burns to escort the degree candidate and Professor Hope Lewis to join me at the podium. Mr. President, I have the honor of presenting Rashida Manju for the degree Doctor of Laws. Thank you, Trustee Burns. Rashida Manju, gifted lawyer, visionary legal scholar, tireless advocate for women's rights. As special rapporteur, on violence against women for the United Nations Human Rights Council, you have held nations accountable for meeting international standards, protecting the human rights of women everywhere. In your role as 
international, at the International Criminal Court as an advisor to the, world, the Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice. You have applied your legal acumen, experience, compassion, and boundless energy to bring the force of international law to securing women's rights. During South Africa's transition from apartheid to democracy, you helped codify the rights of women in the South African Constitution and founded programs to ensure the efficacy of the nation's domestic violence laws. In recognition of your enduring commitment to strengthening global protection for women, thereby advancing the cause of universal human rights, Northeastern University is pleased to bestow upon you the honorary degree Doctor of Laws. In recognition of this degree, Trustee Burns will vest you with the hood. And now, I'm going to present you with the diploma. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rashida Manju more fully. Dr. Manju is an internationally recognized lawyer, teacher, activist, and public servant who has worked tirelessly to advance women's rights and human rights around the world. Since 2009, she has served as Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women for the United Nations Human Rights Council, documenting abuse and calling attention to nations that fail to comply with international standards on the human rights of women. We have been honored here at Northeastern to help host a project associated with this work. The project has fo focused on the obligation of states to exercise due diligence in enforcing rights set out in international treaties. In this work, we have come to appreciate Dr. Manju's dedication, creativity, and the intelligence that she brings to bear on a critical but sometimes apparently intractable issue. A native of South Africa, Ms. Manju, Dr. Manju helped to enshrine the rights of women in South Africa's constitution, leading the development of the Women's Charter during the country's transition. She also served as a member of South Africa's Commission for Gender Equality, a constitutional body mandated to protect and promote the rights of women. To ensure South Africa's laws against domestic violence, she has been deeply involved in developing both national and provincial programs. She established the Gender Unit at the University of Natal's Law Clinic and founded the Domestic Violence Assistance Program at the Durban Magistrates Court, the first such project in South Africa. The program quickly emerged as a model for other courts in South, Af in South Africa and around the world. She brings the same expertise and influence to the International Criminal Court as a mentor of the advisory board to the court's Women's Initiative for Gender Justice and previously as a member of its Women's Caucus for Gender Justice. Dr. Manju. Thank you very much. I'm sure you're tired of speeches, so one more. <laughs> President Owen, Dean, Sp I need to turn. <laughs> Dean Spiller, faculty, staff, students, and distinguished guests. It gives me great pleasure to be here in my favorite city in the world, yes, even in the winter. 
I have had friends recently tell me that after the last winter, I would not feel the same way. I think my friends are in denial that there is a correlation between aging and the lack of tolerance for, um, for uh, difficult situations that go on and on, like you have experienced this winter. It is an honor for me to deliver the commencement address on this auspicious occasion to the graduating class of 2011. My sincere thanks go to the President of Northeastern University, the Dean of the Law School, and especially to the Office of the President in particular for the care and responsiveness in the arrangements of my trip. Thank you very much to Sue Cromwell in particular. Class of 2011, you are both fortunate and privileged to be graduating from Northeastern University School of Law. As you know, this is considered one of the top public interest law schools in the US. This is largely due to the experiential based legal education, the cooperative legal education program, the clinics, institutes, and specialized programs, and the activists and ad advocacy student groups that exist on this campus. The pedagogy employed by the dedicated faculty includes ideological, descriptive, and case studies methods. These factors reflect a commitment to providing an education that is underpinned by a passion for law and social justice and the need to contribute to challenging and eliminating the root causes of social injustice. And guess what? The system works. Thanks to Renata and Susan, I have the following statistics, which Dean Spiller has mentioned already. 95% of you completed a public interest co-op, with 68% completing more than one. This totaled approximately 300,000 hours of legal work on co-ops, both domestically and internationally, in 32 states, 15 countries, on six continents. I think we deserve a <laughs> 300,000 hours. You worked in, amongst others, international criminal tribunals, private law firms, for federal, state, and local government agencies, with nonprofit organizations, and with the Public Defender's Office, amongst others. Well done to you all. May the spirit of contributing to social change continue to be part of your future. Our response and responsiveness to others is based on our values, principles, and experiences. We are shaped by interactions within our families, our communities, and the larger society in which we live, and also by the institutions that we participate in. The hope always is that both public and private institutions teach us values of justice, fairness, tolerance, and also the skills to be thoughtful, to question our assumptions, and to examine our perceptions. As an important institution in your life, this law school has chosen to move beyond the teaching of technical legal skills and to also include public service values as part of your education package. The end goal is to have students who seek to cultivate meaning, understanding and truth through engaging with the other, both inside and outside the law school, and students who ultimately have the capacity to develop enhance and enrich the legal system. Faculty also gain in this process, as teaching is a process of imparting knowledge as well as one of self-discovery. This is hard work. Law and legal education is not necessarily associated with justice in different parts of the world. For example, in my country, law was an instrument of oppression and discrimination. It was a weapon that was used against people like me and I now use law as a tool to fight against all forms of oppression and discrimination globally. Dean Spiller, in her message in the Winter 2007 International Law Issue, in describing how the law school was responding to a new world order, referred to the connection between domestic-oriented education and global-oriented uh, systems. She spoke about the need to understand law as a normative system in a larger context, 
and the responsibility of the law school to provide the necessary tools to students to enable them to practice law in a, in a global market. This has led to the inclusion of international law and norms into the domestic core curriculum, the introduction of new courses on international law, the involvement of faculty and students in international projects and international co-ops and placements. Despite this internationalization, Dean Spiller stated in that article, we remain committed to our roots, but our branches reach the entire globe. I would like to pay tribute today to some of the social justice projects that you are part of in different ways at the law school. The program on human rights in the global economy in its most recent project developed the Boston principles on the economic, social and cultural rights of non-citizens. This document acknowledges the disproportionate adverse impact of laws and policies on the human rights of a particularly vulnerable group and seeks to find remedies using the norms and standards that exist in international human rights law. Truly an example of the global is local. The Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project seeks to redress for past national harms, seeks to address impunity and the lack of accountability, and to achieve justice for individuals and families for human rights violations committed against members of the civil rights movements by both state and non-state actors. A crucial aspect of this project is its mission to seek and establish the truth, and most importantly, to institutionalize memory. The Domestic Violence Institute describes itself as an educational service and research organization dedicated to combating partner abuse and sexual assault. In providing both services and training, the project is committed to empowering clients and client communities. This commitment indicates an understanding and a respect that the clients and communities are experts on their lives and that they just need the necessary tools to be active agents in their own cause. And last but not least, the work of a dear friend, Professor Brooke Baker, who took me in when I was homeless in Boston a few years ago, and who works in the HIV AIDS sector. His passion and commitment to place universal access to medicines on the human rights agenda at the global and local levels is inspiring. Brooke and his students continue the struggle of challenging intellectual property rights and trade policies that negatively impact access to medicines in the developing world and also work on the challenges of funding for medicines and services in the health sector. As many of, the other many of the previous speakers have mentioned, an important institution is also our families and our parents in particular. Public service values emanate in our evolving relationships in our families. We are shaped by them and we also shape them. And as young graduates, you have a role to play in also shaping the lives of your families and your communities in the social justice work that you undertake. The 300,000 hours of co-ops is also a testimony to your roots, to your families, to your significant others. And as I think it was Kristen who said, um, you, can, you have been cranky, you have been sleep deprived, you have bags under your eyes. I would like to pay, to, and she, you know, named people, uh, didn't name them individually, but spoke about the saints in all our lives. And the saint in my life, my husband of 36 years, I continue to remain cranky. <laughs> I continue to, and he puts up with that, so thank you. The ethos, values, and culture of this institution have been important in further shaping your social justice agenda. At the individual level, there are also values that are crucial in how you respond to the environment that you are entering as you embark on a new chapter in your life. In this regard, as an African woman, I would like to draw on one aspect of African philosophy, that is the cultural and belief system of Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U. 
In the Kosa language, Ubuntu is interpreted as a person depends on other people to be a person. As articulated in some of the South African constitutional court cases, which you know all our progressive um, jurisprudence that has emanated, the attributes of this philosophy include, amongst others, interdependence or interconnectedness, human dignity, respect, communal communality, humanness, compassion, solidarity, and responsibility. In a fundamental sense, Ubuntu denotes humanity and morality, and its spirit emphasizes respect for human dignity. This philosophy emphasizes both rights and duties at the individual and the group levels as part of one's responsibility to create life in common with each other. This is reflected in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which upholds the importance of the interests of the individual, but contextualizes these interests by emphasizing its effect on the group. The combining of individual rights with a communitarian philosophy allows for the realization of respect for dignity without derogating from the rights of the individual. As you navigate the murky waters of individualism, self-interest, vested interest, power and privilege, my hope is that you will include in your interactions some of the attributes of Ubuntu. In, in conclusion, congratulations to each one of you and also to your proud families and friends. I wish you the best in all that you undertake in the coming years and encourage you to take your learning to the world, but to never make a god of money and ambitions. Also remember to value your own voice and to speak truth to power. And finally, remember social justice work, it's not about you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Manju. The degrees will now be conferred. I call upon Provost Stephen Director. Thank you, Emily. Mr. President, it is my privilege to report to you that the candidates here assembled and others have qualified in all respects for the degree Juris Doctor. They have successfully completed curricula offered by the School of Law and have been recommended by the faculty and the Board of Trustees to be awarded degrees in recognition of their academic accomplishments. Emily Spieler, Dean of the School of Law, will now present the candidates. Will the candidates for the degree of Juris Doctor please rise and remain standing until your degree has been conferred. Mr. President, it is my honor and my privilege to present to you the candidates who have qualified in all respects for the degree of Juris Doctor. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of this university, I do hereby confer on you and all those who have properly qualified the degree of Juris Doctor with all the honors privileges and responsibilities thereunto pertaining. Graduates, I salute you. Will the graduates please be seated. The marshals will now present the graduates to the platform Diana Piquero and John Enterline will announce the name of each graduate as they are presented for hooding by Associate Deans Martha Davis and Lee Breckenridge and receive their diplomas.
Amarin Loring Aberjaley. Namitha Agarwal. Albert Pete Alston. Andrew Angeli. Lila Atta. Murray Azi. Catherine C. Bailey. Andrew Lawrence Baldwin. Melissa Berishman. Sharon Duty Barney Jordan Berenger Robert Warren Berry Ryan Berry Richard Holt Bateman Leslie Bauman Danielle Rose Beaver. <laughs> Noah Becker is being hooded by his mother, Joanne Shotwell Kaplan, for his late father, Stuart Becker. Rodney Bedo <laughs> Jessica Janelle Bell <laughs> Alicia Latoya Benjamin Edward Stephenson Bertrand. <laughs> Diodene P. Batari. <laughs> Ra
Rebecca Beshef. Kelly Beethoven. Jenya Helen Blazer. Adam Daniel Blackman. Alexis. Bowie. Jean Ellen Bowker. Bernard Brick. Benjamin Michael Brinkert. <laughs> Brittany Elizabeth Brown. <laughs> Shannon L. Buckingham. Timothy Burdick. Eliana Burns. Samantha Lee Bushy. Crystalline Calderon. <laughs> Cecilia Candia. <laughs> ben Carlos. Noreen Charania. <laughs> Roxana Cheng Hung. Amber Nicole Cochran. Elizabeth Ann Connor. John Ottavio Conti. Austin Dana. Ian Davis. <laughs> Jennifer Davis. Shari Alexandra Dawkins.
Elizabeth Ann Diedrich. Julia Christina Dekovich. <laughs> Cleo Deschamps. <laughs> Lauren Elizabeth DiGiovini. Elizabeth Ashley DeMarco. Kristen Dobrel. Deidre Faye Donahue. Zoe B. Dowd. <laughs> Jantina Angela Duger. <laughs> An Hong Duong. Na sorry. Natani Alicia Edi. <laughs> Alexandra Easy. Easily. Seth Eckstein. Jason Warren Elliott. Stisha A. Emmanuel. Vincent, Vincent Thomas Enriquez. Christopher Shea Fletcher. Peter Michael Fogg. Amelia Yana Garcia. Sarah Raquel Gautier. Rory Justin Gill. Sheila Teresa Giovannini. <laughs> Drew Glassroth. <laughs> Alina Barrios Gomez. Ariella Dora Gregg. <laughs> Ro
Raquel Elena Gramet. Jasper Jacob Groner is being hooded by his father, Gerald Groner. <laughs> Jessica Gustin. Elazar Catherine Horace. H. Alex, Alex Harrison. Laura Marie Healy. Catherine Morin Hecker. <laughs> Brian Edward Hilburn. <laughs> Liza Maria Hirsch. James Michael Hodge. Christopher Jenkins. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Wait, who's also? Is it Jessica? Okay, order. All right, Jessica Lynn Jones. Okay. Kim Jones. <laughs> Melissa Joyce. <laughs> Robert Mark Katz. Hadra Khan. <laughs> Suhi Kim. <laughs> Cami Joe Kimber. Joe Thumb Kinder. Daniel J. Klein. Aaron Elizabeth Kravitz. David Kuzma. Asia Lakov. Alex Lawie. Christian Michael Levin. Anthony Riculo Leone.
Lily, Lily Lockhart. Christopher Brian Logue. Veronica Louie. Timothy Luke Lyons. Megan Catherine McKenzie is being hooded by her father, David McKenzie. Sean Paul Malloy. Lorena Marez. John Marty. Catherine Matthews. Sean McDonough. Elizabeth Jane McAvoy. Christopher Michael Merman. Ryan P. Minard. Benjamin Meshulam. Caitlin Millerick. Monica J. Milton. John Edward Minnelli. Paula Mall Rexak. Marshawn Edward Morrison. Engie Mota. Tiran Nodler. Malika Meki Napoli. Jonathan Newberry Nichols. Richard Nijviki. Ann Warren O'Connell. Natalie Rose Olius. Lee 
Aaron O'Neill. Hajin Park. J. Rajenda Patel. Sorry. Nathaniel Patti. Jillian Rochelle Piccioni. Danielle Denise Ponder. Rosalinda Cohen Ressland. Abigail Prescott Ricas. Robbie James Rutzel. Rashida Amina Richardson. Jennifer Rose Robertson. Gil Rockbert. Matthew Douglas Rogers. Zoe E. Root. Aaron Rothberg. Brittany Sierra Russell. Lauren Elizabeth Russell. Douglas Robert Ryan. <laughs> Julian M. Ryan. <laughs> Nancy K. Ryan. Elizabeth Gary Ryland. <laughs> Jay Samuels. <laughs> Laura Sc Stanacondro. Adrian Santiago. Samuel Paul Sawan. Matthew Joseph Schultz. Zachariah Thorpe C.
Michael Vincent Sara. Persephone Christian Shelton. Marissa Sherman is being hooded by her mother, Joan Lingenton, and father, Robert Sherman. <laughs> Elizabeth Nettleton Shitu. Kaylee Tara Simon. <laughs> Timothy John Smith. Okay. Shathan Sirinasa. Talia Jasmine Stostel. Jane Alexandra Sugarman. Emily Regine Tassanari. Matthew William Thompson. Mary Richard Titcomb. William Turner. Daniel Thomas Urankar. Erica Jean Virtue. Brian Volger. Elizabeth Colsell Volini. <laughs> Megan Waters. <laughs> Catherine Watkins. Philip Mar Marcus Weber. <laughs> Quinton Weld is being hooded by his mother, Susan Weld. <laughs> Christopher Witten. Adam Lee Weiner. Nathan Wong is being hooded by his father, Le Leslie Wong.
Kelly Hay Youngy. John Enerline. So let's hear it for the class of 2011. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Graduates, I have some good news. We're ahead of schedule. But my speech is getting longer. Chris, could you give me yours? Kristen, in my book, you're all saints. I, Chris, I don't know whether I should give you or the dean a joint appointment in the School of Poetry. Rashmi, we are going to welcome the newest uh, alum, and please call her Northeastern. Yes, we like that. Rashida told me that this was her first commencement ever in the United States, and she was a little bit nervous, but she did a great job. Let's give her a round of applause. Graduates, I would like to remind you of Northeastern's mission. Our mission is to educate you for a life of fulfillment and accomplishment, and to create and translate knowledge to meet global and societal needs. These simple but powerful principles have helped to shape your legal education. Each of you has charted your own distinctive path towards a life of fulfillment and accomplishment. You did it through your courses, your co-ops, and your engagement in the world. These experiences have enriched your lives as well as your careers. The second part of our mission, to create and translate knowledge to meet global needs, is not only relevant to scientists and engineers, it is relevant for you as well. More than ever before, the world needs your skills to master the challenges of a global age. All around us, the world is changing rapidly every day. The spread of global commerce, technological advances, and struggles for freedom are raising new legal questions about international trade intellectual property, privacy, and human rights. Both here and elsewhere throughout the world, intense debates are raging about government's proper role in society, in areas ranging from education and public health to energy and security. Resolving these challenges, answering these questions, will demand the skills that you have acquired through your legal training. In other words, we need you. During your time here, you have done much more than learn case law and precedence. You have learned how to think and to be engaged. You have learned how to untangle complex situations in search of core truth. Most of all, you have learned how to apply the principles of the law to address the novel challenges we now face globally. And also, you have learned to face the unknown. So class of 2011, 
This is my brief charge to you, and I'm stressing brief. Go forth today invigorated with all you have learned. Let your intellect and creativity enable you to chart bold new paths as legal practitioners, scholars, and engaged citizens. Let your tenacity and resilience enable you to answer the complex legal challenges of our age, no matter how daunting they may seem. Let your passion and compassion enable you to improve the lives of your fellow men and women. And finally, let your work and scholarship embody our mission to meet our society's need throughout the world. Graduates, and salute you. I salute you. Go party. Congratulations. Chief Marshal. Will the audience remain seated until the faculty and graduates have recessed? The graduates will follow the marshals for their class photograph. Families, guests, graduates, and participants are cordially invited to attend a reception immediately following today's ceremony. The reception will be in the west wing of the Curry Student Center. Signs and university hosts outside the center will direct people to the reception area. Thank you. 